Each year, at Maruga, on the south coast of Trinidad, people of the village and visitors from far and wide gather to witness the reenactment of what is arguably the single most important event in the island's history. Its discovery by Christopher Columbus on July 31st, 1498, some 500 years ago. Today, Trinidad and Tobago is a modern Caribbean nation whose people are a cosmopolitan mix of Indians, Africans, Chinese, and Europeans. Yet, behind this legacy of our colonial heritage lies an ancient and mysterious past. Thousands of years before Columbus arrived on our shores, Amerindians journeyed in their canoes from the South American mainland across the narrow dividing strip of water and made the island their home. They were the first Trinidadians. Like ghosts from another world, these first settlers left no written records and built no great cities, yet their traces exist all around us. High in the mountains of the Northern Range, on a building site in the heart of San Fernando or along our beautiful beaches, we can still discover the footprints of these early inhabitants. Their story is the history of Trinidad and Tobago before Columbus. It is a fascinating voyage of discovery, a journey through time itself. Trinidad is the southernmost island of the Lesser Antilles. In the prehistoric past, just as today, it was a gateway. In those far off times, people were moving north from the mainland to settle the islands. Paddling their seagoing canoes, they left the shores of Venezuela, coming first to Trinidad, then to Tobago, Grenada, and beyond. The first settlers arrived in Trinidad some 7,000 years ago. They lived along the coast, in the fertile margins of rivers and lagoons, penetrating deep into the island's heart. Evidence of their presence can be seen in the heaps of shells known as middens, scattered across the island. Dr. Nicholas Saunders, an archaeologist from the University College of London, has made a special study of these middens. These people were not farmers. They depended for their livelihood on hunting, gathering and fishing. As we can see at the site of Cocal here on the eastern side of Trinidad, which is between 1,000 and 500 years before Christ, this is nothing other than a huge mound of shells. Chip Chip, Donax, and also Clam. The tools themselves were very, very simple stone, as we can see here. This is typical, although not the earliest, of the sites of the first Trinidadians. It is from a somewhat earlier time that archaeologists have discovered the first human remains, not just for Trinidad, but for the whole Caribbean. Found in 1971, on a hill at the southern edge of the Oropouche Lagoon, the Banwari skeleton was carbon dated to 5,000 years before Christ. The family of this ancient Trinidadian lived in this area for about 1,500 years. Around 300 BC, these early hunters and gatherers gave way to a new wave of people from the Orinoco Valley of the mainland. Known as the Saladoid people, their first foothold in the Caribbean was here on the southwest coast of Trinidad. Just a few hundred yards away from me up here is one of the earliest and most important archaeological sites in the whole of Trinidad and in fact indeed for the whole of the Caribbean. That site today is known as Cedros. This site was discovered in the early 1940s by geologists from the Trinidad Petroleum Development Company. It was excavated several years later in 1946 by the Trinidad archaeologist John Bulbrook and his American colleague Irving Rouse. They managed to find radiocarbon material here in the form of charcoal. And when they dated this, it came out incredibly to around 200 years BC. The red and white pottery, which Bulbrook and Rouse found, 
was one of the most important discoveries in the archaeology of Trinidad. It has made Cedros the type site for this kind of pottery, which has a distribution throughout the Caribbean. Along with this and the various shells which you can see here, these early Trinidadians also brought agriculture from the mainland of South America, particularly the making of cassava bread from manioc. Many of the artifacts which came from Cedros show the definitive shapes of ceramic griddles and small little adorno heads of zoomorphic creatures which adorn some of their early pottery. Apart from pottery and agriculture, these new people brought with them a host of other skills and ideas that changed the face of human settlement in the Caribbean. They lived in large villages ruled by chiefs and shamans. They were expert at basket work and at spinning and weaving cotton into clothing and hammocks. Their religious and social lives were highly developed, using hollow reeds for inhalation and sometimes specially shaped nostril bowls like this one, shamans would enter the spirit world in drug-induced trances. Accompanied by sacred music, played on a simple flute, skin glistening with bright colors applied with a roller stamp, the ancestors would be consulted and cajoled for the welfare of the village in hunting and curing. The ancestors also control the unpredictable forces of nature, fierce and dangerous animals, earthquakes, dramatic weather, and the sometimes spectacular explosions of mud volcanoes like this one in the south of the island. All were regarded with supernatural awe and required the intercession of the shamans. Most importantly, these were the first Caribbean farmers growing cassava, sweet potato, and tobacco. Their taste for cassava is crucially important for archaeologists because its method of preparation required the use of ceramic griddles. Archie Chauhaja Singh is secretary to the Archaeological Committee of Trinidad and Tobago and attached to the Archaeology Center of the University of the West Indies. These sherds are from a large cassava griddle found at an Amerindian site in southeast Trinidad. Cassava was the staple diet of the Arawak. Sherds like these are undisputable evidence of an Amerindian presence. Alongside such implements came a new technology in stone. Highly polished green stone axes like this near perfect specimen were used both for felling trees and perhaps for symbolic exchanges between tribal chiefs. Known today throughout the Caribbean as Thunderstones, they were highly prized and were traded from the mainland throughout the islands. It is however for their distinctive pottery that the Saladoid peoples are best known. The virtually indestructible fragments of once whole pots, plates and jars are found throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Their durability is a boon to archaeologists who spend much of their time studying and reassembling the ancient pieces. In 1997 and 1998, an international team guided by Archie Chauhajase found impressive saladoid remains while excavating an ancient village site near Gasparillo in west central Trinidad. The expedition was led by Dr. Kofi Agosa, an archaeologist from Portland State University in the U.S. This program is being uh, undertaken in collaboration with uh, the uh, University of the West Indies in St. Augustine, Trinidad, and particularly the history department that has been very supportive of our programs here in Trinidad. Uh, the material we recover are all washed and indexed, inventoried, and catalogued and placed in storage here in Trinidad. We don't take them abroad and they are stored in the archaeology laboratories uh, at the University of the West Indies here in St. Augustine's in Trinidad. And uh, Archie uh, Chawa Hajasing is the person who takes care of these things in the lab. And so we are glad that we are able to have these things stored for other people who may want to study it uh, in the future. Today, at the National Museum in Port of Spain, there are countless pieces of pottery and other relics from Trinidad's prehistoric past. Originally adorning ceramic bowls and jars, these figures are known as zemis, 
and represent the gods and spirits of the Saladoid people. Similar larger figures carved in wood and stone symbolized the forces of nature. All show the high degree of craftsmanship that was characteristic of the Saladoid. Sometimes spectacular archaeological discoveries are made by accident. In 1990, a diver discovered a large and almost complete ceramic bottle of the Saladoid series in the waters off Port of Spain. This unique find reveals the ambitious sophistication of these master potters. It also poses intriguing questions of whether this piece was lost overboard from a canoe or was offered to the spirit of the waters as an act of religious devotion. Over the next 1500 years or so, new peoples arrived from South America, each bringing their own pottery making styles and settling every corner of Trinidad and Tobago. These were the Amerindians who watched in amazement as Columbus's men stumbled ashore in 1498 looking for water. At that time, there were probably 40,000 to 50,000 Amerindians living in Trinidad. It was a melting pot of tribes and languages. Arawaks occupy the south coast around Maruga. Carib-speaking Karine Pagotos lived in the northwest. The Yawa tribe had settled around the Pitch Lake in Labre, and the Nepoyo inhabited the east and southeast parts of the island. It may have been the Karine Pagotos who etched these startling images on what is known today as the Carib Stone, high on a hill overlooking the Maracas Valley. Sometime between 500 and 1500 years ago, Amerindians up here at Caurita and the northern range of Trinidad carved these strange enigmatic figures into this giant slab of quartzite. Known to archaeologists as petroglyphs, such images are found throughout South America, Central America and the Caribbean and are widely regarded as images of ancestors, spirits and gods. Despite the well-documented evidence for Amerindians throughout Trinidad, the drawings here at Trarita are so far unique. But almost certainly somewhere in the northern range of Trinidad there are other equally enigmatic and mysterious figures. For Amerindians at that time lived throughout Trinidad and particularly sacred were the places of the northern range. For Amerindians the location of such carvings was extremely important. Sometimes they faced up to the stars and we know from early historical evidence that Amerindians of Trinidad and the Caribbean and indeed South America created such carvings specifically to relate the earth, the sacred earth, with the skies and sacred constellations up there. In this particular case, the Kaurita drawings are facing down a sweeping, impressive valley. It is almost as if the images themselves are looking to the south-southwest, to that part of Trinidad, and beyond to Venezuela and the heart of South America. The arrival of Europeans in Trinidad, as elsewhere in the Americas, was a disaster for the native peoples. Apart from warfare and slavery, disease cruelly ravaged a population which had no natural immunities to smallpox or even the common cold. By the beginning of the 17th century, it is estimated that there were only 4,000 Amerindians left. Initially, these survivors were organized into encomiendas, which meant they had to pay tribute of food and labor to the Spanish colonists. Amerindian names such as Aruca and Tacariqua point to the location of these encomiendas into historical times. The old Amerindian trail linking these sites is now the eastern main road between St. Joseph and Aruca. After the encomienda system collapsed, the remaining Amerindians grouped in mission villages such as Savannah Grande, now Princess Town, Siberia, and Arima. By 1826, those who still survived, numbering about 500, had converted to Roman Catholicism. By 1850, the missions themselves had disappeared, and the remaining Amerindians gathered together in Arima. Yet even today, Amerindian middens can still be found beneath some of the old Catholic churches, such as the one at Mayo. This was the site of one of the early Roman Catholic churches established in this village of Mayo on an, a midden that was um, Amerindian. It was established by the Capuchin fathers 
several years ago when they did a number of missions in, in Trinidad. Here at the back of the Mayo church, uh, we have evidence of Amerindian civilization. The Amerindian village was located here and we have bits of Amerindian pottery as well as shells. And we also have a mixture of, of, um, of Spanish colonial glass, which probably came from the early church. This was the site of the early village and the hidden stretches right under the church and on the whole hill where we are. The old wooden church at Mayo was recently demolished and a new one of brick built in its place. Much of the midden is now covered under a foundation of concrete. The turbulent history of Amerindian Trinidad was confused further during the 19th century when a new influx of Amerindians from the mainland settled in western Trinidad, leaving behind them the famous legend of Pitch Lake. Quite apart from what archaeology tells us about the early occupation of the Pitch Lake, there are also a number of very interesting and significant myths and legends which connect the creation of Pitch Lake with Amazonian Indian beliefs from South America. One of the most famous of these involves the so-called Chima tribe who used to live in the middle of the Pitch Lake in a big village. Apparently the chief sent out some of the warriors to hunt and kill hummingbirds. Unfortunately for him, the hummingbirds were in fact the spirits of the ancestors who took revenge by destroying the village and sinking it into the ground, thereby creating the Pitch Lake. Associated with this also is the origin of tobacco. Amerindian myth relates how the hummingbird, the spirit bird of the Amazonian shamans, took the seeds of the tobacco plant over from Trinidad to South America. This is especially important because the shamans and the medicine men or sorcerers of South America would use tobacco, particularly strong wild tobacco, to go into their hallucinogenic spiritual flights of ecstasy in order to communicate to the spirit world of ancestors. At around the same time, Chaguanes Amerindians from the Orinoco Delta came to Trinidad, preserving their name today as Chaguanas. There was also an influx of people of mixed Spanish Amerindian descent who came to work the Coco Estates. They became known as Coco Pañol and bequeathed us their Parang music. Today, Trinidad's archaeological heritage is under serious threat. Several middens, the remains of once thriving Amerindian communities, are now disappearing into the sea. This is especially evident at Guayaguayari, where there has been considerable erosion. And man must share part of the blame. Construction projects sometimes cut through the sites of Amerindian villages, necessitating emergency excavations. Exactly this happened in 1997 at Harris Promenade in San Fernando. This site here was discovered a couple of days ago. When I was passing around the street, I was able to look at the color of the soil, which represents humus and a mixture of all sorts of material from an Amerindian midden. Now, actually, this is in the heart of San Fernando, close to the, close to the St. Joseph Convent on this side, the police station, the, the, the city hall and the churches and this huge promenade is being cut to develop. Actually, um, this is the price to pay for progress because a lot of this material has been taken away. If you look at the height of the land here, you would have seen that this actual midden that we are digging here is something like one meter down so that a, a meter of stuff has already been taken away and destroyed. Despite the disastrous effects of the European conquest, Trinidad still has a living link to its pre-Columbian past. This is the Santa Rosa Carib community in Arima, whose mixed blood members claim partial descent from Amerindian ancestors. Today, the spiritual focus of the Arima Caribs is the annual Roman Catholic festival of Santa Rosa de Lima. After Mass at the Church of Santa Rosa, the same statue, garlanded with pink and red flowers, is paraded through the town in solemn procession. Yeah. 
The ceremonial figurehead of the community is the Carib Queen, the formidable Husta Werges. I will be queen of my people because I love them. Plenty of them do say I don't, I'm not the Carib because they put themselves with someone else. But it's not so. God made the Carib and he make it because he loved them, and that is his own. So after that, he put them here in Harima. That is how he had to be. So that is why I say, I love my people as God knew it. He put me to that, and I love them, and I love all as long they belong to Trinidad. You understand me? Because I know Plenty mix, the white mix, the Indian mix, the Creole mix, with what? The plant of the curry. So I can't run on. But all have to come, gather in, gather in like the crayfish. And when they come, the queen will talk to them and make them to understand and let we cooperate together and work together. It was Husta Werges who taught Ricardo Hernandez, the moving force behind the community, how to make traditional crafts and foods. Such activities lie at the heart of the Arima Carib's efforts to re-establish their cultural identity and affirm their rights to land. The Santa Rosa Carib community of Arima for the past 24 years have been trying to maintain the cultural traditions of the original people who are here in Trinidad. The, the, the community is made up of the descendants of the indigenous people, the Amerindians. And I, I like to clarify this point. By no means the community is 100% Amerindian. The people are of mixed race. Um, they, but they know that they came from that from the people who are here originally and they are mixed with the Spanish and with every other ethnic group that you would find in Trinidad and Tobago. So they hold on to some of the traditions that the indigenous people had with them such as the um, making of crafts and especially those crafts that relate to the everyday life of the indigenous people, the making of the what we call the kulev, known also as the matepi and the sebukang, the manare, the wareware, and these are implements that are used to process mayok, cassava, for the making of cassava bread, farine, which is the staple, the basic food that the Amerindians use. Also, there is the festival of Santa Rosa that the Carib community identifies with. And this festival has been developed by these people, the original people, when they were converted to Christianity by the Catholic faith. This is the only festival that brings the community together. The pride they feel in their adopted name links the Arima community to the Caribs of Dominica, the Black Caribs of St. Vincent, and the Amerindians of Guyana and Venezuela. The wider international perspective on the struggle for identity among indigenous Caribbean peoples was well expressed by Chief Auguste in Dominica in 1993. The way forward for the Caribbean people in Dominica now has not only been going back, it has not only been going back, but I see it as, yes, going back for research, finding out our past, because I believe the past is what is going to help us put together the present to identify where we want to go in the future. And also I'm saying that if we go back, it helps us to, to get something that we can identify with as caring people. I mean, a number of people may think, well, how do you go back to some of your traditional past and be able to cope with the modern days? It can work. It has worked in communities in, in Venezuela. I've seen it worked out there. And I believe very well that um, once people get conscious enough to know what they have come from and what have made them be what they are today, it can continue to go forward.
that the very same way in the future and even better. As if to give wings to Chief Auguste's hopes, the canoe Glee Glee, made according to age-old Carib tradition, set sail from Dominica in May 1997. Its voyage took it south through the Lesser Antilles to Trinidad and then beyond via the Orinoco, deep into the heart of the Amazon, repeating a journey made countless times by the ancestors of the Caribbean's indigenous peoples. It is important we recognize that the Rima Carib's search for identity and recognition is part of a wider quest for the soul of a multi-ethnic Trinidad and Tobago in the modern world. Trinidad and Tobago's prehistoric past resides in its archaeological heritage. There are over 200 archaeological sites known today, and many more await discovery. Yet we have no archaeologists and very little appreciation of just how rich, how important is our Amerindian legacy. It must be hoped that in the future, government and the business community will join forces to fill this void. Archaeology is the nearest we can get to time travel, a journey back through 7,000 years of history. It is a search for our earliest ancestors, those first Trinidadians whose names we still speak and whose spirits still wander the beautiful and sacred places of Trinidad and Tobago.